Hello everybody, welcome to this evening's talk. My name is Lukas Walkenberger and I want to present a part of my PhD research about partition scars and whether they are related to pregnancy and birth. This research was performed within the framework of the project The Value of Mothers to Society, or VAMAS in short, which focuses on developing methods to estimate births and pregnancies on skeletons, but also on child rearing practices in prehistoric Europe. My colleagues and I re prefer the more general term pelvic features over partition scars, as it is still unclear whether all of them are truly related to pregnancy and birth. Pelvic features are grooves, pits, or bony exostoses, which can be found at the bony pelvis. Usually they occur at the muscle or ligament attachment sites or close to joints. In my research, I looked at five different pelvic features. The pre is the most common one and is located next to the sacroiliac joint at the ilium. Two types are known. A sulcus with a scooped out floor, as you can see in this picture, which only occur in females and the sulcus with a smooth floor, which occur in both sexes. The first type is also named groove of pregnancy and the second groove of ligament. Then there is a similar sulcus at the lateral body of the sacrum, also next to the sacroiliac joint, the mago auricularis groove, which rarely occur in male individuals. My colleagues Doris Pani Kutra and Michaela Spanagel Steiner, both working at the Natural History Museum of Vienna, detected thin ventrally pointing osseous extensions at the ventral superior margin of the sacral wings and named them sacral preauricular extensions. These extensions occur exclusively in female individuals. Another bony exostosis can be found at the pectineal line of the superior pubic ramus. It is often present in male individuals. And last, at the pubis, Sometimes lytic lesions occur as dorsal and ventral pubic pitting. Especially dorsal pubic pitting is very interesting as it forms at the attachment site of the levator ani muscle, which is part of the pelvic floor and has to stretch more than three and a half times during the birth process. So birth injuries might be quite common in this area. There are several hypotheses published, which might explain the expression of pelvis shape in relation to obstructive birth and maybe pelvic features. I do not want to mention them in detail here. Overall, all the theories have in common that large pelvis support an easy going birth and evolutionary pressures towards smaller pelvis decrease the fitness of the mother to be. As a compromise, the cranial size of the fetus and the pelvic inlet of the mother is limited. Nevertheless, cephalopelvic proportion is usually small, which increases the risk for complications during birth. Birth contains a complicated sequence of movements of the fetus during its descent. As you can see in this picture here, there's not much space for the baby to pass. So, mother produces the hormone relaxin, which softens pelvic ligaments and makes them more flexible. However, the tension to the ligaments leads to hemorrhages and cyst formation, at the attachment sites, and this might be one plausible cause for pelvic features. So, all pelvic features are frequently seen in female individuals, but some of them rarely also occur in males. Moreover, previous studies are very inconsistent about this topic. Some of them could find a relationship with birth, others couldn't find any, though they even used the same collections. Another issue is that many studies just used archaeological material with unknown obstetrical records. This is obviously not the best if you want to test your data against unknown variables. Moreover, many studies used univariate length measurements of the pelvis instead of a multivariate approach. So we expected that obstructed birth is more likely to cause pelvic features as it increased the stress to the pelvic ligaments more than the birth process in general. Not every woman who had given birth do express pelvic features. I used a geometric morphometric approach to address this topic. I used 54 pelvis of the Weisbach collection part of the Natural History Museum. This collection is very interesting for research as we have known background information about the disease. So, we could also identify a few females who died in purple feather, so shortly after birth. 
but detailed obstetric records were not available for the Weisbach collection, so I expected to find a trend in pelvic shape in individuals with large pelvic features, which might be consistent with obstructed birth. From articulated pelvis, I produced photochromatic models and placed over 330 landmarks on them in Evan toolboards. They were placed, as you can see on this picture here, on every important anatomical structure of the pelvis. All stages of pelvic features were also set transformed to avoid that features with many stages have a larger impact on the analysis than features with only two or three stages. And finally, I used exploratory analysis in R statistics, such as principal component analysis and partial least squares analysis. By using the PCA, it was only possible to separate female from male individuals along the first principal component, as you can see on the left plot. There was no grouping of single pelvic features in any principal component, as you can see in the example on the right hand side for the left periocular sulcus. So, in the next step, I performed a partial squares analysis. A PLS tries to maximize the covariance between a group of variables and pelvis shape. I used a combination of all pelvic features, though I had to exclude some of them which rarely occurred in my data, because they just would produce noise in the analysis. So it ended up with the Margo Sacralis groove, periricular circles, extended pubic tubercle and ventral pubic pitting in the female sample, and the periricular circles and extended pubic tubercle in males. As you can see here, the PLS was significant in the female sample only. So in this talk, I focus now on the significant results. In this plot, you see the relation between pelvis shape on the x-axis and pelvic features on the y-axis in the first dimension of the PLS. And you clearly can see that there's a nice linear correlation. In this plot, you can see the loadings of pelvic features in the first dimension of the PLS. What's important to know is that the Margus Sacralis groove and preauricular circus are highly covariated to a certain pelvic shape, which I show you now. On the left hand side, this pelvis represents an individual with a low score for the preauricular sulcus and Margus sacralis groove, and on the right hand side, this pelvis represents an individual with high scores for pelvic features. And between the left pelvis and right pelvis on this slide, you can see that several anatomical structures are changing. So, for example, the pelvic inlet is much larger in individuals with a low score for pelvic features than individuals with a high score for the preauricular circus and Margus sacralis group. Also, the ischial spines are more protruding inwards the pelvic handle in individuals with a high score. If you look at the subpubic angle, this is also changing from more wide in individuals with a low score to much narrower. And also from the lateral view, the sacrum is much more curved in individuals with a high score. So the question is, are these truly caused by obstructed birth, as all these features are narrowing the birth canal? Well, please also have a look at the acetabulum. It is also changing from a more introverted position to more retroverted. So another explanation for these shape changes might be a retroverted acetabulum. A retroversion of the acetabulum is quite unknown in anthropology, so I want to provide a short overview about the structure. In humans, an introverted acetabulum is very common, retroversion quite rare. The position of acetabulum is also not fixed. There is a shift from the position from introverted to retroverted over age, and a retroversion also increases the strain to the pelvic ligament. So medical doctors commonly associate a retroversion with pelvic pain, osteophritis, femoral acetabular impingement, but also stress fractures of the acetabulum and femoral head. Orthopedics commonly diagnose a retroverted acetabulum with three different syndromes. The first one is the so-called ischial spine syndrome. So this is an elongation of the ischial spine uh, protruding the pelvic canal. And if you look at my data, 
you can also see this elongated if you're spying. Second feature is the so-called crossover sign. If you look at radiographs, the anterior border and, and posterior border of the acetabulum are not crossing in an antiverted acetabulum. This is the upper picture. On the lower pictures, you can see that both margins are crossing. Also, in my data, if you look closely, the crossover sign is clearly visible. The third feature is the posterior wall syndrome. In physiologically oriented hip joints, the posterior wall is crossing the femoral head at its centric point. In a retroversion, the depth of the acetabulum is reduced. So the posterior wall is crossing the femoral head before its centric point. Well, I cannot answer the question whether the posterior wall syndrome is present in my data, because in the Weisbach collection, just pelvis are corrected and no femora are present. In most cases, a retroverted acetabulum is symptomless, so people don't have pelvic pain or other pathological troubles with the pelvis. If a retroverted acetabulum is diagnosed by plain radiographs, uh, the symptoms are highly dependent on pelvic tilt and pelvic rotation. Well, as I used 3D models to diagnose the symptoms and the retroverted acetabulum, I don't have these problems at all. Also, a retroversion is suspicious to increase stress to the sacroiliac joints, such as sacroiliac joint dysfunction. That would fit pretty well into my data, as the free auricular sulcus and macrosacralis groove are both located beneath ligament attachments for the sacroiliac joint. Often one side is stronger affected than the other, so an asymmetry of the pelvis is also expected. It again fits pretty well into my data, as usually one side, uh, the sulcus is much more deeper than the other side. I want to show you the loadings of the pelvic features a second time, because if you remember at the beginning of my presentation, there are two types of the preauricular sulcus. The groove of ligament, which can be observed in males and females, and the groove of pregnancy, which only occur in females. In the PLS, there's a mixed signal of both types. So I separated them and repeated the PLS to determine which type causes the shape changes I showed you before. As you can see in this plot here, the groove of ligament plus produced a small signal in the first dimension of the PLS. In contrast, the group of pregnancy is largely responsible for the signal in the data. And that is very interesting, because in previous papers, researchers assumed that the group of pregnancy is predominantly related to pregnancy and birth, but the group of ligament is more likely related to biomechanics. So if my proposed explanation for the retroverted acetabulum is right, it seems that also the group of pregnancy has a strong biomechanical component. To sum up, the strong expression of the preauricular sulcus in Margo Sagalis group is related to narrowing of the birth canal. So, this is consistent with obstructed birth. However, the anatomical structure also points towards an acetabular retroversion. So, this would be also one plausible biomechanical explanation for the preauricular sulcus in Margo Sagalis group. If you have any questions, please post them in the comment section of this video. You can also contact me for further information about my research and questions. If you're interested in the VAMOS project, you can have a look at the OREA homepage or the Motherhood in Prehistory blog. Thank you.